Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 1. It's in the green book on page 83. What is thy only comfort in life and death? That I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Saviour Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood hath fully satisfied for all my sins, and delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life, and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. How many things are necessary for thee to know that by enjoying this comfort, mayest live and die happily. <coughs> Three, the first, how great my sins and miseries are. The second, how I may be delivered from all my sins and miseries. The third, how I shall express my gratitude to God for such deliverance. Beloved, if there is one thing that makes the CPRC in Ballymena and the Limerick Reformed Fellowship unusual among churches and fellowships, it is our adherence to confessions and especially our practice of preaching the Heidelberg Catechism. And I noticed last week that your pastor has begun again to preach through the Heidelberg Catechism and I thought that this sermon, which I preached last year in Limerick, would be a suitable introduction to the season of preaching Heidelberg Catechism. Because there are many, especially in places like Limerick, where there are so many evangelicals, who are offended by the practice of Heidelberg Catechism preaching. In fact, they think that we are doing something wrong by preaching the Heidelberg Catechism. And when they come to the Limerick Reform Fellowship and they see that we have what they call the pink book, which is the three forms of unity, our creeds and confessions, they wonder, what is that? And why do you have that? And why do you preach, they would call, man-made doctrines from a man-made document such as the Heidelberg Catechism. And perhaps some people here who have visited the CPRC have wondered why does that church have that green book? And why does that church preach out of that green book once a week during the worship services? And perhaps others who are members here wonder, should I really invite someone to hear the preaching of the Gospel when the minister is preaching the Heidelberg Catechism? Would that not be difficult for me to explain? Would that not be embarrassing if I were to invite someone to that particular service? And is it perhaps wrong for us to preach the Heidelberg Catechism? Should we not just preach the Bible? Those are questions which you may have had yourself or you may have heard other people ask you. Heidelberg Catechism preaching, beloved, is not something new, something that the CPRC and the LRF just made up. Heidelberg Catechism preaching has a long and venerable history in the Reformed churches. The Catechism was written in 1563, and this year will be 450 years old. Reformed churches have been preaching the Heidelberg Catechism from the very beginning, and God has blessed that practice of preaching the Heidelberg Catechism from the very beginning. 
And therefore, as we shall see this evening, Heidelberg Catechism preaching is not to be feared or despised. It's nothing embarrassing which we ought to hide, but it is good for the church. The Heidelberg Catechism was written to be preached, and God's people have been edified by the grace of God by means of Heidelberg Catechism preaching for almost 500 years years. And so we're going to look at this practice and answer several questions. Our main question is the theme, why Heidelberg Catechism preaching? And under that theme we have three other questions. First, why confessions? Second, why this confession? And third, why preach this confession? To answer that first question, we must know what a confession or a creed is. Begin with that word creed. That word comes from the Latin <coughs> to believe. Credo or credo, I believe. It is therefore a statement of faith. The Apostles' Creed is a statement of faith produced by the early church. I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in a whole pile of other things as well as God the Father Almighty. The Belgian Confession, another one of our creeds, begins this way. We all believe with the heart and confess with the mouth. And in that sense, all Christians of whatever denomination they might be, if they are believer, believers, are creedal. A non-believing Christian is a contradiction in terms. A Christian who believes must say what he or she believes. Psalm 116 verse 10. I believe Therefore have I spoken. But a creed answers another question. You say you believe. What do you believe? What exactly do you believe concerning various aspects of the revealed truth of God? What do you believe about God? What do you believe about Christ? What do you believe about the church? What do you believe about salvation? All the rest which are revealed to us in the word of God. And so to have a creed or a confession, a church has an identifying mark which shows itself to distinguish itself from the world. We believe this in distinction from this. This is what another church might believe. This is what the world believes. We believe this. This is our creed. I believe. Therefore have I spoken. A creed is more than that though. A creed is a statement of belief which has become official. Every Christian has his or her personal creed, you might say. It may not be written down. It's in the person's heart. It may be confessed sometimes on a person's lips, but a creed, in the sense of the Heidelberg Catechism being a creed, or the Belgian Confession being a creed, a creed is an official, written down statement of belief. And you get a creed when many Christians together in the church gather themselves together to study the Word of God and then they write down in a formal statement what they believe. And then the church officially adopts that statement and that becomes a creed or a confession of the church. Now some creeds are more formal than others. Perhaps a church might only have half a dozen statements written on a piece of paper at the back of the church which has been approved by the leadership of that church. That is their little creed, you might say. Perhaps there are a few statements on the church's website. That is that church's creed.
creed. But well, once the creed becomes official, then it becomes binding upon the members and especially the office bearers of that church. And then, having become official, it is a creed in the real sense of the word. Now creeds are necessary for the church because of what Christ says in John chapter 8. Turn back to John 8, which we read together. Look at verse 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus says, a person must believe that he is he. Believe that I am he. Otherwise, you will die in your sins. What does he believe? What does he mean by that statement? To believe that Jesus is he. Well, that means that you must believe and confess certain things about the person and work of Jesus Christ. You must confess that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. He is He. You must confess that He is the eternal Son of God, the prophet, priest, and king, the one that God sent into the world to be the Savior. In fact, according to verse 58, you must believe that Jesus is the I Am, who was before Abraham. You must believe, therefore, when you believe that Jesus is He, in John 8, you must believe that that means that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, Jehovah in the flesh. Not to believe that, says Jesus, means that you will die in your sins. And Jesus goes on in the chapter, in verse 31, where he says, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Notice that. Continue in my word. There are many Christians today in the church world who believe that Christianity is merely a spiritual encounter with the person of Jesus Christ that makes them feel good about themselves. Jesus says, no, you must continue in my word. You must believe what I say. You must therefore have doctrinal content to what you believe. Believing that I am He involves that as well. And how do you continue in the Word of Christ? By believing it, by following after it, by obeying it, by submitting yourself to it. Not by burying it in the ground, not by making it a fossil or a relic, but by using it, by developing it, by mining the riches of it. You see, the Bible, as we have received it, the 66 books of the Bible, is not a theological dictionary with an index where you can look up various passages and various subjects. The Bible comes to us as the Word of God, as the revelation of God from heaven. You might say it comes to us in the form of a seed. We have in the Bible the seed, and that seed then grows or develops throughout the history of the church as the church begins to understand more and more of the content of the Bible. And Jesus promises that in John 16, 13. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. All truth. That does not mean that we will become omniscient, knowing everything that there is to know. Or even that we will know everything that there is to know about religious truth. Or that we will ever understand every jot and tittle of the Bible. Because the Bible is inexhaustibly rich and deep 
and even the greatest theologian who has ever lived has only begun to scratch the surface of the riches contained in the Bible. Nor does it mean that God promises us infallibility. The Bible is infallible. We are not infallible. The church is not infallible. The church has been led into all truth over a long period of time with many mistakes along the way, with much stumbling, struggling against error, trying to come to terms with what the truth is, trying to understand it and explain it and systematize it and develop it. And also it means we don't receive all of the truth at once at the very beginning of the history of the church. As I said, as I see, Christ gave the church a precious deposit of the truth and he called the church to develop that truth to mine its riches, to understand it more deeply, year after year. And you can see that in the history of the church. The church has received the truth, and has studied the truth, and has understood more of the implications of that truth, until the church has been able to set down in its own words what the Bible teaches about various things. Thing. And when the church has done that, they have written creeds. And they have said, I believe, or we believe, and write down a list of things that the church, after studying the Word of God, has come to believe. That's a creed. A confession is like a creed. A creed means I believe. I confess means I say with. I say with. Or the Greek is I say the same as. We confess, or we make a confession, we confess first of all by saying the same thing as God, or as saying with God. So when a believer, let's say, confesses his or her sins. The believer there is saying the same thing as God. God says, what you've done is sin. You are guilty of sin. You must confess your sin. And we say not, I have not sinned. That is not sin. I'm going to redefine sin for myself. No, we say, yes, Lord, I agree. I say the same thing as you do about my sin. I am a sinner. Forgive me in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's true of every doctrine of the Word of God. The Bible says something. Remember when the Bible says it, God says it. God says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the church says, when it confesses, I agree with what God said. I say the same thing as God does. I say with God that God is the creator of the heaven and the earth. And the Bible says, and God says through the Bible, that Jesus is the Son of God. And we say as the church, we confess that. We confess that he is the Son of God. We say the same thing as God said. It's like an echo, you might say. God says it, and we echo it. We agree with it. We confess the same thing. <laughs> But there's more to confession than simply confessing the same thing as God. We confess, we say the same thing as, we say with other Christians. Other Christians. You might say a creed is something personal. I believe, as an individual Christian, I believe. A confession is more communal or collective. We together, as God's people, we confess. We confess the same thing as God in his word, and we confess that together as the church of Jesus Christ. You could talk about the confession of the church like a flag, like a banner under which the church rallies its army. We're all under one banner. 
We're all holding up the same truth in the midst of the world. That's the calling of the church, remember, to lift up the truth, to be the ground and pillar of the truth. We do that together as a church of Jesus Christ by holding up one confession which we all agree is what the Bible teaches about various subjects. And so when a church adopts a confession, when we as a church adopt the three forms of unity in our green book or in our pink book, we are saying we agree with all of these doctrines together as a body of believers. And that's comforting to us. We are not the only ones on the face of the earth who agree with the contents of this Greek book. And specifically with the Heidelberg Catechism. There are churches all across the world which have as their confession or creed the Heidelberg Catechism. Therefore, insofar as they do that, we are in agreement with them. There's also the historical aspect. In adopting a confession or a creed, we are saying that we say the same thing as the church of the past. We have not reinvented the wheel, let's say. We agree with what the Holy Spirit led the church of the past to confess in her confession. Remember the church has been led into all truth from the very beginning of the New Testament church. Christ's promise did not simply start in 2012 or perhaps at the time of the Reformation even. The church has been developing studying and being led into all truth for the last 2,000 years or so. And that's why the church has been abiding in the word of Jesus Christ as Jesus says we must. Verse 31 again, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And that's the sad attitude of many Christians today who, can, who despise confessions. I have a Bible, so that's all I need. I don't care what the church struggled with in the past. I don't care it took the church a century to come to a definition of the Trinity and how the Father and the Son and the Spirit are related to another in the Godhead. I'm going to ignore all of that and start again by myself, with my Bible in my corner by myself. And again, with all the other doctrinal controversies of the church. We do not do that. And that's why we have confessions. Confessions written, mind you, long before we came into this world. Now there is much anti-credalism in the church world today, many reject creeds. Many have objections, serious objections, they might say, to the creeds. Some people reject creeds because they want to be able to believe and teach whatever they desire. They say creeds restrict our freedom. And I say they do. And there's a reason for that. Others have creeds but never really use them and don't really believe them. Go to many a church in Ireland, Northern Ireland or the Republic of Ireland, and ask them, do you have a creed? <coughs> and they might eventually admit that they have a creed. Say a Presbyterian church, they might tell you well, we do have the Westminster Confession of Faith, but we don't like to talk about it very much. And they're very embarrassed that you have asked them about their Westminster Confession of Faith. You come here, you ask us to leave a creed. Oh yes, here it is. You're free to take a copy home. You're free to read it for yourself. Ask questions about it. We are open and honest about what we believe the Bible to teach. 
Others have genuine problems with the creeds because they have never really understood them. And they have grown up in a situation where creeds have always been spoken against. Now, of course, the first objection to creeds, which you've probably all heard, is that creeds are extra-biblical. We don't need a confession, they say, because we have the Bible. We don't want man-made documents in our church determining for us what we can believe and what we can preach. Because they say we believe the Bible. Now, of course, we must point out that the creeds are not above the Bible. Nor are the creeds even equal to the Bible. It is possible that there could be errors in the creeds. I say it is possible. But, and here's the but, the creeds have been used in the church and the Heidelberg Catechism in particular for almost 500 years. And if there was an error in that confession, you would expect by now that someone in the church would have found it and would have been able to prove not to be to himself, but to the church at large, that there is an error in the Heidelberg Catechism or the Belgian Confession or the Canons of Dort, and to my knowledge that has not yet been proved, and therefore I see no reason to assume that there is an error in the creeds. The creeds must be judged by the Bible, but we confess that the creeds are a faithful summary of what the Bible teaches. And because that is the case with the creeds, the creeds have real authority in the Church of Jesus Christ, especially with the office bearers of the Church of Jesus Christ. I, as a minister, you're a pastor, we have sworn to preach only in accordance with the doctrine as it is summarized in our confessions or creeds. We have willingly bound ourselves, therefore, to those creeds. They have that kind of authority. And when a church no longer binds their office bearers to creeds, anything goes. Just look at the church world today. You can believe, you can teach whatever you want. Doesn't matter. No one's going to say anything. Because there is no authority, they will say, in these creeds. You've all heard, I'm sure, the battle cry of those who reject creeds. No creed but Christ. I only believe the Bible. And that sounds very pious, but examine that statement for. A moment. Is it helpful and is it honest to say, I only believe the Bible and our church only believes the Bible and only teaches the Bible? Let's say you leave here and you go to another congregation and you ask them, what do you believe here? Now imagine this is a church that doesn't have any creeds and doesn't believe in like creeds. doesn't believe creeds. We believe the Bible will be the answer that you will receive. What have you learned from asking that question and receiving that answer? What have you learned? Nothing. Nothing. You could go to the Kingdom Hall of the Jehovah's Witnesses cult or to a Mormon church and ask the same question and you will get the same answer. What do you believe in this group? <coughs> we believe the Bible, they will say. Go home then, read the 66 books of the Bible all the way through, and then you'll know what that church believes. No, you won't. You won't have a clue. <coughs> That's not good enough. That's not the question you want to ask. You say you believe the Bible. Good. What do you believe 
the Bible to teach? That's the question. And that's the question which is answered by the creeds of the church. Take such a church. You believe the Bible. What do you believe about God? Do you believe that there is one God or that there are many gods? One God. Okay, you're a monotheist. Do you believe in one person or three persons? Do you believe in the Trinity or do you reject the Trinity? Oh, I believe the Trinity. Okay, you're a Trinitarian. We're getting somewhere. We're beginning to understand something about where you and your church personally stand on these issues. You simply cannot today have as your only criterion of church membership, I believe the Bible. And you certainly can't have that as the criterion for someone to be an office bearer in your church or to preach in your church. If the PRC got rid of their synodical exam and just had one question at the exam, do you believe the Bible? Yes. That wouldn't tell us very much, would it? That would be very easy for heretics to sneak past the examining committee, wouldn't it? That would mean anybody could join the church, no matter what they believe. Anyone could preach in the pulpit, no matter what he believes. Because he would simply say, I believe the Bible. You must accept me on the basis of the fact that I believe the Bible. Well, not so fast. What do you believe the Bible to teach? And all such churches and all such groups have a creed. They do. And that's why I say they're not honest. They do have a creed. It just isn't officially written down somewhere so you can ask for a copy to study it at leisure at home. But you go there to one of these evangelical groups and say, I am a Calvinist. <coughs> I believe the five points of Calvinism. Is that acceptable in this group? You will find very quickly it is not acceptable in the group. I have a child. I would like him baptized. Is that possible in this group? You will find very quickly they don't believe in infant baptism in that group. I don't believe in the rapture, the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. <coughs> You'll be shown the door of that group. Because they do those things. They're part of their creed. It's just they're not mentioned anywhere on their website, written down at the back of the church, in any official document, you wouldn't know. And besides, this anti creedal attitude ignores the development of truth in the church and ignores all of the attacks of the devil. And it's really very, very naive. Look at John 8. What does Jesus say you must believe in John 8? You must believe that Jesus is he. That's what you must believe. Now, if I came to your church and I said that the sum total of my knowledge was this, I believe that Jesus is he, would you allow me to be a member of your church? Of course you wouldn't. You'd be a fool to do that. Well, let's move a little bit into the Bible. Acts 8.37. The Ethiopian eunuch. He is baptized on confession of his faith almost immediately after hearing the preaching of Philip. And he says this, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So now we have more detail, don't we? I believe that Jesus is he. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Would that statement be good enough to be a member in a church today? Ought it to be good enough to be a member of the church today? Now everyone who is a member of the church believes that, but they believe more than that, do they not? And they must believe more than that in order to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. You will not today baptize someone and accept them into the Church on the basis of such a limited and undeveloped confession of the truth. They may be very sincere, 
But they must believe <coughs> more. Move in your church history to AD 325. Controversy is swelling in the church at that time. A man called Arius has risen up. And he says, I believe Jesus is he, and I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but I do not believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. I do not believe he is God the Son. I believe he is a created being, the most glorious of all the creation of God. What does the church do? Well, that's fine, because you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We don't care about the content of your belief. Of course the church does not do that. The church demands that Arius sign a confession using a word that the church has invented, you might say, to describe the relationship between the Father and the Son, which relationship was not yet developed in the time before Arius, because Arius had not yet arisen to cause controversy in the Church of Jesus Christ. And so the Nicene Creed was written. And to be Orthodox, to be baptized, to be a member of the Church, you had to confess that Jesus is of the same essence as the Father. More than He is He, more than He is the Son of God, you must believe, and this is the word they used, homoousion. To be Orthodox Christian, you must believe Homo Ulsion. And Arius says, well, I don't like that word Homo Ulsion. I'll compromise. I'll go as far as Homo Ulsion, which means of a similar essence to the Father. Is that good enough? And the church said, no, it's not. If we can't confess the Orthodox confessional truth of Homo Ulsion, and instead insist on homoiosion, mind you, there's one other difference. You can't be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. And from that time onwards, that was part of the creed that every Christian had to confess. It wasn't good enough anymore in the Church to say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, without qualifying exactly how Jesus is related to the Father in the being of God. <coughs> Then go to 451 AD. Now there are people who say, I believe in Homo Ousian. I believe that Jesus is of the same essence as the Father in the being of God, but now the controversy is over the human nature and the divine nature of the one Son of God and how those two natures are related to one another. And the church says, again, we must meet together. We must hammer out this subject. We must decide from the Bible what the Bible actually teaches about this complicated issue. And once we've decided it, it becomes official. Everyone who wants to be a member of the church from that time onwards must be able to confess what the Council of Chalcedon teaches about the two natures of Jesus Christ. Not good enough, therefore, after Chalcedon even to confess homoousion. Now you must confess more. And that's the way it has been in the Church of Christ for 2,000 years. After another controversy, the Church's confession becomes more detailed and more precise. And that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Which means the demand of the Church becomes more stringent for Church members. Which is why today, in a Reformed Church, it takes a long period of time and careful instruction in all the doctrines of the Church before someone can be admitted to be a full confessing member of the Church. That's why in Acts, for example, they were baptized almost immediately. But now it takes a while before an adult convert who is living baptized before is baptized in the Church of Jesus Christ. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But to say, as evangelicals often say in their naivety, I believe the Bible, I only believe the Bible, is to ignore all of that history and open yourself up to all kinds of error 
in your church. You have them in your church, Arians and other heretics, who you don't show themselves because you haven't asked the right kinds of questions. Because you've ignored the fact, by denying the need for confessions in the church, that the church has developed <coughs> and unfolded the truth as it is given in the Word of God. And that's why, too, you reject another objection to the creeds. People say that creeds are divisive. That's true. They are divisive. They're supposed to be divisive. Nicaea did not try to find a word which would please both the orthodox and the heretics. That's what modern ecumenical groupings do. They try to find something that we can all agree on, as imprecise as possible. Get as many people under it as possible. No, Nicaea said, we want a word which is orthodox and at the same time excludes the Arians from the church. Because they are not going to be orthodox, they are heretics. We must expose them by finding a word that will expose them. And that's what a creed does. A creed exposes someone who is a heretic or holds false doctrines. That means that that person cannot become a member of of the church. And so a creed or confession divides the church from those who will not believe the truth as it is confessed by the church. They divide us from the unbelieving world and they should. They divide us from the departing and apostate churches as well. Remember I said the creeds are like banners or flags. They are necessarily divisive. You can't have two armies fighting on one battlefield under the same flag if they are supposed to be against one another. That would cause utter confusion. There must be clearly distinct differences between the true church and the false church and the world. And the creeds make sure that there are such differences. <coughs> That's why a church must be honest. A church must be upfront about what that church believes. It must be able to show what is your creed? What is your confession? What do you really believe here? What does the minister preach here? Would I get the impression if I came to your church that your minister believes the creeds? Has he even read them? That's the question I ask many people who say they belong to various churches who have various Confessions. Have they even read them? And creeds are only divisive because of man's sin. We ought all to believe the same thing. And in the church, especially, we ought all to believe the same thing. A creed should be a kind of a rallying cry. Let's all gather ourselves together under this confession or under this confession. Let's all agree on the words of this confession that they are the words of the Word of God. That's why the Belgian Confession says, we all believe with the heart and confess with the mind. <clears throat> now why do we have in the CPRC and the LRF, why do we have the Heidelberg Catechism? Now obviously part of that is providence. God has led us to have the Heidelberg Catechism and God led the church to produce the Heidelberg Catechism. We don't have the Westminster Confession because we don't agree with everything in the Westminster Confession, for example. But what is this Heidelberg Catechism? It is a Reformation Creed. It was written or produced at the time of the height of the Reformation, 1563, which is one year before Calvin's death. If you look at church history, you'll notice that there were a huge number of confessions and creeds written at the time of the Reformation. Because there was a flourishing of faith. And when there's a flourishing of faith, there's also a flourishing of the producing of confessions. Because faith always wants to confess itself. So the Lutherans want to confess themselves in a certain way. 
And the Calvinists wanted to confess themselves in a certain way. So we have the Belgian Confession, we have the Heidelberg Catechism, and you know we have the Canons of Dort. Many confessions written at the time of, or shortly after the time of the Reformation. When a church is serious about the Word of God, she becomes serious about confessing the Word of God and writing her own confessions. The Heidelberg Catechism was written and produced in the city of Heidelberg, which is in Germany, in the region called the Palatinate. And Heidelberg was a university city. It was set up by Frederick III, or as he is known in history, Frederick the Pious. And Frederick the Pious, or Frederick III, wanted to make Heidelberg a centre of Reformation learning. And for that reason, he called together many of the great minds of the Reformation of his day to teach and study in Heidelberg. And two of those men are the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism, Zacharias Ursinus and Caspar Olivianus. And Frederick wanted a catechism produced, and he asked these two men especially to make this catechism. And he had various goals. His first goal was he wanted there to be a catechism so that he could have the people under his care instructed in the Reformed faith. He did not want to have an ignorant populace. He wanted the people to know Christ and the words of Christ. He wanted the catechism to be simple so that even the children and young people could understand it, which is why even today we have the practice in the CPRC and the LRF, God willing, of teaching Heidelberg Catechism to the young people in special catechism classes. Second, he wanted a biblical catechism. That was something that Frederick insisted upon very strongly. He wanted it to be a faithful summary of what the Bible teaches. He wanted there to be proof texts, and there are many proof texts. He wanted a simple, clear, beautiful, biblical summary of what the Bible teaches, because he understood that the creeds do not replace the Bible, but the creeds explain the Bible to the people of God. And the third thing he wanted, which he did not get, was a catechism which would promote unity between the Lutherans and the Reformed. He was trying to bring the Lutherans and the Reformed together, and at that time there were very heated and bitter controversies concerning the Lord's Supper in particular, which is why, if you look at the Catechism, there is such a long section on the sacraments, because the Lutherans and the Reformed were especially embroiled in controversy over those sacraments. The Lutherans detested the Heidelberg Catechism, so that one goal of, of Frederick didn't come to pass. But the other ones, they did. In fact, they were surpassed. The Heidelberg Catechism is, first of all, biblical. That is very clear from simply reading through it. The Heidelberg Catechism does not expound so-called man-made doctrines. Every question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism is squarely based upon biblical truth and explains what the Bible teaches on a whole host of subjects. It is divided into three main sections, misery, our sins and so on, deliverance from that misery, and gratitude for that deliverance. It explains in detail all the doctrines of the Apostles' Creed and the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer and therefore it is an excellent tool to instruct the people of God, especially the young people, in what the Word of God says. It is a personal catechism. 
It is not a cold and abstract confession. It is not detached. The language of the Catechism is warm, personal, and heartfelt. The Catechism was designed to be the heartfelt confession of the child of God, so that every Christian could confess it. And that's why it uses so often the second person and the first person. What the child of God knows and experiences in his own, own heart and life about God, who God is, about Christ, about his own sin, about salvation from sin. All of this is confessed with the mouth from the heart. Notice the language. Thou, thine, thy, in the questions. And then in the answers, I, my, mine, me. It's experiential as well. We might think, as Calvinists sometimes, that experience is a bad thing. Experience is a charismatic notion. We don't believe in experiences in the Reformed faith. That's not true. The Catechism is filled with the experiences of the child of God. Real grief over sin, <coughs> sorrow over one's <coughs> iniquity, and then the comfort of knowing that one's sins are forgiven, and then that gratitude that wells up in the heart of the child of God. How may I show my gratitude? By keeping the Ten Commandments, by praying earnestly in the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. And of course, the theme of the Catechism, unlike other catechisms, such as the Westminster Catechism, which is a lovely catechism as well, but the theme of the Catechism is comfort. That's how we read the first question and answer this evening. What is thy only comfort in life and in death? Heidelberg Catechism recognizes that this world is a valley of tears. That the child of God is oppressed by his sin and his guilt. And the Heidelberg Catechism beautifully leads the child of God through the experience of his sin and misery and into the experience of his deliverance and then into the experience of showing gratitude for that deliverance. The three things that Lord's Day 1 says it is necessary for us to know that we enjoying this comfort may live and die <coughs> happily. So you see, it's not an abstract confession of boring theological truth. But we have all of those wonderful expressions. Just read it through. Question and answer 28. What advantage is it to us to know? Or question and answer 36. What profit dost thou receive by? Question and answer 52. What comfort is it to thee that? Question and answer 69. How art thou admonished and assured? And no wonder, therefore, that the Heidelberg Catechism has been so loved by God's people for almost 500 years. Well, that's all very well and good, you might say. I believe in confessions, and I believe the Heidelberg Catechism is a wonderful example of a confession. But why should we preach this confession? Is that not to go too far with this confession, to preach it? Notice that the Heidelberg Catechism was designed to be preached. Very early, it was divided into Lord's Days. 52 Lord's Day, so that the minister can preach through the Heidelberg Catechism, if he has no interruptions, in one year. He sticks to one sermon per Lord's Day. He can go through it in one year. And in so doing, he can teach his congregation the whole counsel of God, from comfort and then misery and all the work of salvation of Christ, all the way to the six petitions of the Lord's Prayer. And that ensures, Heidelberg Catechism preaching ensures, that the members of the church learn all the doctrines of the Christian faith. Nothing is missing, you could, you could say, from their diet, therefore. 
They learn about sin and salvation. They learn about the names of God, the names of works of Christ the Mediator, the Holy Spirit, the truth of justification, the truth of the church, the means of grace, the sacraments, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer. And Heidelberg Catechism preaching is really a kind of topical preaching where the topics are theological subjects which have been chosen by the church in advance. So you know as a congregation you're going to get a diet in this particular order of these particular subjects from the Word of God and nothing therefore is missing. There's nothing edifying that is left out from this diet through the Heidelberg Catechism. But again, the objection always comes. Should we not simply preach the Bible? Why do we use this man-made document? And I answer, we do preach the Bible. But we preach the Bible from the perspective of the Catechism. The Heidelberg Catechism, as I have said, is biblical. And the Heidelberg Catechism simply organizes and systematizes what the Bible already says. Let's say you want to preach a sermon on the subject of creation. What will your text be? Could be Genesis 1. Could be Hebrews 11 verse 3. Could be Psalm 43. The Heidelberg Catechism takes all of that teaching and boils it down to a couple of short sentences in one Lord's Day and applies it to the child of God to his comfort and gives the minister therefore something to preach about creation and all the other subjects of the word of God are treated that way <coughs> and often by the way that objection oh you're not preaching the Bible often comes from churches where the Bible is not being preached because there's more to preaching the Bible than getting up with your Bible and saying a few things about the Bible, or not about the Bible, saying a few stories and sitting down again. There are many churches which have no creeds and which also don't preach the Bible because they never explain the text of the Bible. They simply waffle for 20 minutes or so. And Heidelberg Catechism preaching forces, well not the force, but it does, it forces the minister to preach through all of the doctrines of the Bible and therefore he misses nothing. Sometimes the minister might not mean to miss things, but perhaps doesn't think about preaching about certain things. Would I think about preaching about the sacraments once a year if I didn't have the Heidelberg Catechism? Would I think about preaching about Christ's descent into hell regularly if I didn't have the Heidelberg Catechism? Probably not. Others, other ministers like to preach their own little favorite passages and don't go far away from them. Or their own little pet theories about the end times. And the people never hear about half of the doctrines of the Bible. <coughs> And then, of course, the Heidelberg Catechism, too, exposes false or weak preachers. <coughs> Let's say you have a preacher who doesn't really believe in creation, or is a bit iffy on the doctrine of justification by faith alone, or doesn't really believe in the doctrine of hell, or denies the virgin birth. The best way for a minister not to get into trouble is simply not to mention those things, ever, just to avoid them. And the people will never know what their minister thinks about those things. But if you're in a church that insists upon the Heidelberg Catechism being explained year by year, you can't avoid those things. The minister is going to have to expose himself. Lord's Day 23-24 about justification, for an example, will stare him in the face every year. He has to say something about it. Every doctrine is mentioned in the Heidelberg Catechism. He doesn't get there for to pick his own favorite things every year. I've been in churches. You get the same thing. 
the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, God is love, and some other drivel year in, year out. You never know what the minister believes about anything because he is not teaching any doctrine systematically. And God has blessed Heidelberg Catechism preaching for almost 450 years. And a church which has Heidelberg Catechism preaching is grounded in the faith. They know what the Bible believes on every subject. They are united in one faith and they are comforted by the gospel. If a person is a member of a church like this, <coughs> And they have Heidelberg Catechism preaching by the grace of God, and they're listening and paying attention. They ought to know all about these doctrines contained in the, in the Gospels and in the Word of God. There ought not be ignorant people in the church who don't have a notion about what the Bible teaches about any given subject under in its pages. You don't have that. You ought not have that. It also means that the Catechism, the Creed, is the living confession of the church. It cannot simply gather dust on a shelf somewhere if the minister every week opens the catechism, reads the catechism to the people, and explains to the people from the words of the catechism, from the word of God, what the catechism means. And it means that everyone in the church who hears the same preaching week by week from the catechism believes the same thing. There is true <coughs> doctrinal spiritual unity. Not that we all just agree to differ on various things, but we actually all believe the same thing. And every minister believes the same thing as all the other ministers. So when I come to preach, I preach the same doctrines as your minister preaches. Or when a professor or minister from the PRC comes, he preaches the same doctrines. Why? Because we all confess the same three creeds, the three forms of unity. And finally, Heidelberg Catechism addresses the heart of the child of God. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Literally, that means speak ye to the heart of Jerusalem. <clears throat> so the catechism preaching must never be a dry doctrinal lecture. The catechism itself forbids it to be such. It must be a living application of the doctrines to the child of God. It must bring the child of God comfort, not simply in Lord's Day 1, where that's the main idea, but throughout the Catechism. There must be this constant refrain of comfort, of personal application, of experiential religion. So the child of God is built up, edified, and abides in God's word. And when we preach sermons like that, beloved, and when you hear them, then you will abide in the word of Christ. Amen.